So I'm starting off this evening's episode with a nice deep breath because that's what we need right now is definitely some breathing. So welcome to tonight's special episode of Hey Sister. Sister. Yes. We are not okay. No. We are not okay. So we got uh, Lakeisha saying, I'm tired. Yes. We are tired. And so tonight, this space, you know, we already have our episode planned for Sunday where we will be having a mental health expert on because we want to talk about how we get to healing and getting to healing. Hey, Arnetta, how you doing? Thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, for those of you who are tuning in, um, hey, if you want to join this broadcast with us and to jump in for a few minutes to talk about how you feel, shoot me, a, um, send me something on Messenger and I'll send you the link because we wanted to have an inclusive conversation tonight. But Sunday, we had already planned to talk about getting the healing. But right now, I just want us to acknowledge that we're not okay. And it's okay to not be okay. And we said, you know what? We have to talk about this because I'm tired. I'm stressed. Like Lanise said here in the, the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm sick and I'm tired and I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's where we are this evening. Um, how you doing over there, sister? I know today's been rough for you. We've talked a little bit today, not just mm -hmm. today, the past three days, like this past 72 hours have been surreal, painful. I know I'm talking a lot, I'm rambling. Um, but I want to say this one more thing before I, you know, you come in and chime in. I reached out to our parents today. You know, right before coming on, I called our parents because I just needed to say, how y'all doing? Mama, mm -hmm. daddy, how are you doing? I know you never would have believed we'd be here again, especially the, the scenes that they're seeing from thinking about my mother being in Watts in the 60s when Watts riots happened and thinking about my father growing up in Mississippi and experiencing um, clan rides at night and all of these things. I called my parents, our parents, just to say, how are y'all doing? And I know you probably in disbelief. And our father said to me, I'm not in disbelief. Mm. Based on everything I've experienced from being young up until this day, I'm not in disbelief. Our father turned 70 last year. We celebrated in a very mighty way. And to hear him say that, see, for me, my struggle is, you know, when my father was my age, I was in my 20s. I have teenage kids. We're not okay. And I wanted to come on tonight so we all can talk about that collectively and hopefully get to taking a breath. And we're going to have different people come on with us as we go tonight. Sister, yeah. how are you doing? Um, I think you've already said it. Um, not okay. Um, there are a few people who um, are on, over on my watch party and they too are not okay. And so I want you to please join us on the Hey Sister page. So if you search for Hey Sister, you should see the same icon uh, our, our logo that you see in the top corner. You should see that as the profile picture. Join us there. You can add your, your comments um, directly there so we can populate them on the screen. But, you know, I think you said it. Um, uh, you know, I, I have not talked to our parents in a few days, so um, that's not good. I, I need to have called them. Uh, but yeah, it's been it's been so much. Um, I, I've gone walking every day. And when I go walking, uh, you know, I, I'm still wearing masks to, to stay safe. And so I have to talk loud when I'm walking with people um, through the mask. And and it's like I don't 
I don't even care who hears what I have to say because at this point, they need to hear it. They need to understand what it's like to be a person of color, specifically a black person in the United States of America. Um, you know, I yesterday on, on my team call, I said the same thing. I, I just was like, listen, I, first I wanted, I, I applauded our chief diversity officer um, because she did a presentation. And man, when you see it on a PowerPoint slide saying like, how are y'all doing? Because, you know, we got COVID-19, but we got the tale of two Coopers, but we've got Ahmaud Arbery, but we've got, you know, George Floyd, but we've got, you know, this woman in Florida, Miami lying and saying two black men drowned her child. But we got, it is like when you just see it, it, it just, and then I, you and I, have, we've talked, I said, and we still ain't really heard too much about what happened with Breonna Taylor, which was happening around the same time as Ahmaud Arbery's video that came out. So it just, it feels like a wound that never gets a chance to heal because somebody keeps pouring salt in it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, for sure. Well, we have a few people that are already in um, in queue to come on with us tonight. And so I think you said um, that someone said they wanted to come on with us. I'm trying to, um, you know, m go back and forth to multiple screens. The messenger is not loading up. So if you're one of Christina's friends or one of my friends, shoot me um, a messenger that way so I can try to get you the link. But, you know, we're trying to do double duty by being live as well as um, sending a link. But first, I want to bring up tonight um, my husband, because I think it's important for us to hear a black man's perspective. Um, you know, we have a black man who we grew up with in uh, Thibodeau, Louisiana. He has a comment here. It says, this is a very difficult time for our black men. It seems that even when video footage and witnesses, we are still having to prove ourselves and in innocence. And you know, Fred, I, I, I appreciate that. And thank you for sharing. But you know, it's even more than just proven innocence, it's proven humanity. Hmm. You know, we you're having to prove your humanity. Because here's the thing, if someone commits a crime, yeah, go ahead and arrest them. It's not a death sentence. It shouldn't be. It should not be a death sentence. But for too many of us, it's a death sentence. If I'm speeding, give me the ticket and let me go home. And let me pay my fine, my fee and do whatever. Let me show up in that way. But I wanted to bring, um, you know, especially a couple men on tonight. So my husband is going to come on. And I wanted to hear from him. Um as a black man, as a husband, as a father. And so Jeffrey Sloan, welcome to Hey Sister tonight. How you doing, husband? I'm doing fine, even though you talked about me earlier with my glasses <laughs> and my gray hair, but <laughs> it's, it's all good. It's all good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to fight the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness because, you know, as I come in all the time that you know, I was the first of my mother's kids who was born with full equal rights and you would think things would get better and better, but this has went on since I was born, way before I was born. And you would think that with time, it's just hard to, it's hard to comprehend that we really haven't gotten any better. And to be honest with you, one of the most proudest moments of my life is when Barack was elected but then it seemed to bring out all the ugliness within the United States, that things really hadn't changed. No matter how much you do, they're still looking at you as, as a lesser being. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a man who graduated Harvard, you know, exceeded to be, succeeded to be the president of the United States, and people still wouldn't give him his props because he was an African-American or a black man. And so, how does that feel for the rest of us out here, just us normal people? And every day you go out knowing that you have to work twice as hard or three times as hard to get to a certain level. And then when you think you've made that level and everything should be okay, you get slapped in the face again and again and again. And it's life or death. That's what we're dealing with. Every day we go out the door, 
you know, it was interesting. Yesterday, I went out the house to go to the putting green. My wife said, don't you ever leave this house without letting us know where you are at. And I thought I had told her. But that brings stress to her life and my kids' life because of the fact that we cannot understand that we are human beings and black folks are human beings also. And we're in a society and a structured society where, that was not built for us. And in some cases you have to tear that structure down and build it back up. Thought we had done that, but obviously we haven't. We still have those same prejudices, racism, we have all these things going against us that we have to fight against on a daily basis. And, you know, even when it's not just blatant, it still weighs on your soul. It weighs on our families, it weighs on our kids. We you know it's hard to tell your kids that, you know, everybody will not look at you the same way and just because of the color of your skin. And they have to start living with that. We, we, in, we ingrain that in at such an early age that we start their stress at eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. No wonder by the time we're 25, 30, we're pre-diabetic, we have stress issues, high blood pressure and things of that nature. Um, and then to just, it, it's just a hard road. It really is. It's, it's, it's unexplainable. It really is. I just don't understand. I don't know where it starts, where we have to break this thing down and build back up where, and what structure of our society we have to start. But I don't know. Um, as I said, you know, now fighting the stress of just feeling hopelessness and helplessness. And what can I do to protect my kids, my family? You know, what would I have done if that's one of my friends that were, you know, being treated like that? You know, am I going to rush the police because it would be two, two dead people, two dead black men? You know, I see a lot of my friends on Facebook and other you know, social media things saying that, you know, why did everybody stand around watching? Well, we know that we're not going to be treated the same. If their friends that were taken out of that, that car would have rushed those policemen, you have four or five other ones ready to draw their guns to kill them. Can and I, those can are I just, decisions. Can I jump make. in to that um, real quick? You know, I, yes. I am baffled at the people who act like, well, first of all, there was a young man. His name was Donald Williams. I remember that because I have a friend named Donald Williams mm -hmm. who was out there. And he gave a very impassioned speech um, on CNN uh, two nights ago, and he was saying that he asked the man, the, the police over Derek Chauvin, and I'm going to call him Chauvin because that's what his last name looks like to me, but um, he asked him, he kept saying, sir, just put him in the car, sir, just, and there was a point when he was talking to Chris Cuomo where, you know, he literally just, he okay. broke. And he, he, he saw, and when I saw him start laughing, I knew where this it was gonna go because sometimes we laugh to keep from crying, but mm -hmm. he couldn't help it and he ended up crying anyway. And it was, and I, you know, obviously I don't like to see men cry because then I know they're really hurting. And, um, and he, he just said, I saw it in that man's eyes. He wanted to kill him. Mm -hmm. He said, I kept talking to him, asking him, sir, sir, what he is, help him up off just put him in the car like just arrest him but he he's not gonna do anything and he said and he looked at me his demeanor and everything about him he wanted to kill that man mm -hmm. so when people like to say oh you should have said this you should have said this a, a 21 year old in midland texas also earlier this week also yep. earlier this week blew through uh supposedly blew through a stop sign he so did go through, through a stop sign. Go through a stop sign, which I do every day in my neighborhood because the way our neighborhood is set up, it really doesn't make sense to stop. Nobody does. Okay. But he, this young man, 21 years old, slow roll through the stop sign, did what many of us have been taught to do also go to a safe location. He pulled up in the driveway of, I guess, his grandmother's home. Grandmother's house. It took him six minutes to get out of the car. I'm sure in that six minutes he was contemplating if his life was going to end. Yeah. So in the process, they decide to call for backup. It looked like there were at least seven police out there, guns drawn on this 21-year-old black man. This young man laid on the ground. They wanted him to walk closer. Now, we've seen where one police officer will yeah. scream, stay still. 
The other one will say, come here. And then depending on which one you listen to, your life ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they're not on the same accord. Because they're not on the same accord. That young man laid on the ground, put his hands up. He said, you see my hands up. He put them out. He put them to the side. He had a friend yelling back in, in the background saying, friend, stay down, stay down, don't get up. And she was yelling at the police saying to them, call somebody black because we know you kill us. You kill us based on our skin color. Call somebody black. That young man's 90 year old grandmother came out there to intervene. So for all the folks out there talking about, oh, why they didn't say anything, that man's 90 year old grandmother walked out there with a cane and intervened. And they ran over that old lady. Yes. Mm -hmm. They had no respect for the fact that she was in her yard. They came on her property, ran over her in order to detain him. And for what? Rolling through a stop sign? Man, give me my ticket. See me in court. Do what you got to do. But let me get home alive. And it's it's baffling. It's baffling that we have to have that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Well, we have another young man who um, one of your good friends and he's been on Hey Sister with us before. We want to bring him on um, as well. Mr. Um, A.G. Wasim. we want to bring you into the conversation tonight. How you doing? Good, sir. I'm doing great. How about everybody? This A.G. we not OK. And that's what we talking about yeah. tonight. The fact that we are not OK. Um, and, uh, you know, we're bringing in different people tonight, but we really wanted to hear from some black men. Um, you know, the last 72 hours is, it, it, it's kind of like the last 72 years, but we, we see in the footage. And so just the visualization of it is traumatizing us daily, hourly. I try my best not to watch it, but anytime you watch the news, it's like you want to traumatize us again and again and again and again and dehumanize us again and again and again. So it is really, you know, just so in our, like our psyche is about, it's breaking right now. At least that's where I am. And I know that you're the father um, of two black men, young black men. You're also a grandfather your father of a black daughter and a young grand, your black granddaughter. How are you feeling today? Well, uh, one of the things that I know I'm having an issue with, and this is being honest, uh, I, I had a kid uh, that passed away uh, about maybe two, three weeks ago. Uh, he was supposed to be going to Louisville University. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, and people try to equate this with this young man, you know, who, you know, unfortunately, he's not here. When I say young, I'm 50. He was like 46. But, but, uh, and I tell people, it's it's a shame that this 50 year old man, 46 year old man, is dead right now. And people, we having to argue with people, and they're talking about black on black crime. That a young man mm-hmm. that, that passed away, yes, he did kill, get killed by a black man, and nothing's been resolved. But that's because the police don't know who did it. But if they knew who did it. They would put him in jail, and 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 what bothered me the most to see, you know, my African American sisters and brothers talking about black on black crime because when when you know a brother who's black kills another person who's black and they know who they are, they go to jail. You know, this man murdered this man in front of everybody, and the fact that people act like they can't understand that, you know, I, I don't expect for the white people to understand. I'm just being quite frank. I've seen it too many times, like, you know, but I would expect that us as black people would understand that. And like, for me, it's a little more personal because my, my first cousin, this gen, this gentleman stayed four or five houses down from her. They know their whole family because Jack Yates is in Houston, third ward. I got family that that's from there. So it's, you know, it, you know, it's just sad that, that it even happened. And as someone who, you know, I have a young son. I have an older son. My older son lives in Houston. My young son lives here. And quite frankly, I, you know, I don't let my son go nowhere. You know, he's he's 15 years old. When I was 15, I was kicking it. Like I was, you know, all over the place. You know, you know, didn't have no cell phones, couldn't contact nobody. You know, as long as I let my mama know where I was at, I was good. I don't feel comfortable with my son with that. 
And then I deal with so many other young men, you know, that, you know, I deal with probably my, my organization has 200 young black men, you know, that's in it, you know, and, and quite frankly, even about, you know, another 40, 50 white young men. And it's just, it's just sad, man. Like, you know, that, that our societies at this point, cause we're, you know, I'm 50. Uh, my brother Jeff is a little older than me, but we would have never thought that, and I know I would have never thought that we'd be dealing with this, you know, in 2020, like President Obama said today, there is no way in the world I would have thought that we'd be dealing with this in 2020. And, and, you know, it just shows how deep the hatred is because I tell everybody to me, it appears like it became more once Obama became president. Like, I don't think the hatred's already been there, but I think that, that they, they hated it so much that they have to come stronger with it. Think of all the, the black men, like before Obama was in, pre, in, in office, Rodney King, a couple of, you know, the shooting in New York, but now it's like almost every, every month. Some some young black man is being killed by white people who don't like him because he's black, and it's just becoming. Well, too I, I wanna, and those are just the ones we see, right? Because I yeah, guarantee those are the ones we see. The last seventy-two hours, there's probably a hundred that we didn't see. That part. That nobody yeah. will believe them. That part. That right. nobody will if if you because you know the rule followers want to follow rules but when you try to tell them to follow the rules i'm gonna call the police on you and tell them an african-american man is that, threatening me that was the worst like like you know like for me I, I hate to see the brother pass away and 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 that you know him dying that you know that's on a whole nother level but to see this white woman literally going to her show to see like for yeah. it to be everybody to see you know, like, mm -hmm. like it is no way. Like, let's just take if if she would have just done that to a white man, America would be up in arms. But this woman is complaining that she's threatened, but she put on a show. This African American saying all the trigger words mm -hmm. so that that the police can come there already in, enraged and sight because this, you know, if George Floyd, if he wasn't, you know, he was a big guy. So as a big guy, the six five myself, I know that white, white, smaller police officers sometimes get intimidated by me. I've seen, you know, like other big guys that I'm around, they get intimidated by the big black man. Like, you know, and, and quite frankly, you know, I, you know, we're some of the nicest guys around in my opinion, but, but it's, it's, they're intimidated. And to even know that, just think, to know that he actually worked at the same place with him at an after right. club. To show that, that he was so invisible, because I, I, I'm sorry, I believe that that man knew who the hell he was. I, ain't, yeah, I ain't how, how do you work yeah. with somebody for he, a year? I don't care if you outside, inside, whatever. How do you work with somebody for a year and you don't even know that they Very exist? And this ain't, I'm, not, I'm not talking about like a 50,000 or 500,000 plus organization. I mean, how many people really work at the club? I'm talking about a nightclub. And we talking right. about night we talking about a nightclub. You know, we all, you know, you young ladies are a lot younger than you know me and Jeff. But, but uh, you know, as an older back, I knew everybody that worked that was in the nightclub, and I just was going there to kick it. I knew everybody <laughs> worked there. You know what I'm saying? So you know they had to know each other. You know, and yeah, know the bouncers. You, you know the bouncers. The security, you know the police. You, you know the bouncers yeah. and security know each other. You know they yeah. do. So I mean, come on, now. they gotta work together. And, and, and I, I got in late because I, you know, I was getting food. I had to drive all the way out to Lake Nona, you know, and pick up my son and drive all the way back. But I, I want to know, and, and y'all can answer this for me. Maybe I missed it in, early in the show. Is there any way that we as black people can come up with an agenda that we agree on upon? Because I'm seeing so many people that that, you know, we're so disjointed. And the one thing that we should agree upon is that we should not be getting killed. I see people on my Facebook that are defending it. You know, I mean, black people. I'm talking about, you know, and I'm sitting there like, are, are we really doing this? Mm. You know, are we, is the self hatred that bad to where we can let someone tell us that, you know, this young man did something? And, and when they put out the film that showed, you know, that he was a model citizen. Yes, sir. No, sir. You you saw no resisting arrest. And just think about it. If it wasn't for these cameras nowadays, because if, if it wasn't for these cameras, those guys would have got off. And they still may get off. But because we already witnessed that with Rodney King. 
but they definitely might not have even got charged, which right. is which is crazy. Right. Right. Jeff, you were um, trying to chime in and we have a few comments I want to bring up on the screen here as we go. The thing is, is and this goes back to the Central Park piece. Yeah, she put on a show, but she didn't fit the description that we normally associate with the uh, racist MAGA hat wearing Trump lover. She was actually a person who donated to the Obama administration. That part. You know, was a card a card carrying liberal. So that tells you that even your liberal friends have biases. They know how to work the system. They take control of that privilege and use it against us when needed. So you really have to be careful about identifying who is on your side hmm. because even your so-called friends who you think are okay, they have and carry that implicit bias. They also sometimes misuse their privilege. So they're not always your friend. Now, going back to what AG said about some of black folks who are, who, who are trying to justify this, some people you just have to let go and you can't engage with stupidity with them because they're holding us back from thinking positively about what we should do. Yeah, you can engage them and have you know, a quick conversation, but don't go into the rabbit hole with them because you're not gonna change their mind. They're just gonna knock you off track. And that's one thing I think we have to do as black folks too, is not get off track and get distracted by little things about ignorance. That's what they are put in there to do. And it's, you know what, it's not even getting just distracted by the ignorance, it's being distracted by those who have self-loathing and self-hate because they also don't understand that they are a victim of, of, of growing up in a system of white supremacy, a white uh, focused educational system. And, and so there's so much self-loathing and self-hatred that um, it manifests itself as well. So um, I'm going to pull up some of the comments and then I'll let you two gentlemen close out. And we got another guest we got to bring up. So, um, you know, um, we have the dog walker in Manhattan was the worst. Uh, Sean Richardson here says there needs to be severe consequences for falsely calling the police on black people. It needs to be treated as a hate crime. Um, we have another comment here says the weapon is weaponizing of racism and not only do um, white people, women do it all the time when they do it it goes unchecked it empowers others to do it as well um let's see what else we have here um we have some agreements and we have another one that says the office that officer knew he was being filmed and arrogantly kept his knee on his neck it is so blatant now and yes be aware of the of white liberal bias um, and so that's those comments. So gentlemen, um, you know, any closing remarks Ed, before we bring on our next uh, couple of guests? Yeah, I'll go ahead, Jeff. Uh, my, my biggest thing is we need to make sure that, that we don't fall for the propaganda. We know, like, I don't care what nobody says, they set, they're setting the fires, they're doing the, they're doing the riding, they're doing things that, you know, that we're not doing, but they're trying to put that off on us that we are the ones who are doing that stuff. And, you know, because I don't care what nobody says, you know, goodness well, you can't go burn down a police station where they got guns and they got rifles. And, and they already they already showed us that they don't have no problem killing us. So if we if we're being aggressive to that effect, then I, I refuse to believe that they would not come out and shoot us. And then you saw the I don't know if you guys saw on Facebook where they showed the police officer who started everything at Target's. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, you know, they want to make it out that we're the animals and we're the people that are doing the wrong thing. So like like Demetria said, the whole self-hate and self-loathing, you know, it comes from like over 400 years of oppression because we want to believe, you know, that we're the ones and we're not the ones. So mm -hmm. that's you know, that's something that we got to make sure we we make sure that we make sure that everyone knows that we're not like that. Well, I just yeah. want to know who, who burned down um, Boston when the um, Patriots won the um, Super Bowl. That part we we don't we don't burn stuff down like that, but that's another fact. <laughs> we we might burn a barbecue pit. We gonna leave that right there. Yeah. Okay. That part. Jeff, closing remarks. No, just want to say, you know, even you know, and I, I say this to Ag particularly. You know, we 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 have to watch how angry we get and how depressed we get in these particular situations. And, um, you know, we have to start engaging in conversation as black folks and have our facts together and engage in intelligent conversation 
And if we're going to engage people who, who we consider self-loathing and crazy, you know, I always start the conversation out. Well, if you're willing to sit with me an hour and we will do some research on this thing together to find out the truth, then we can have continue having this conversation. But if we can't, I don't even even need to deal with you because I don't need to get my blood pressure up yeah. and die before I need to. Mm -hmm. yeah. We already have enough stress on us. We already you have know, enough stress on us. Husband, AG, thank y'all so much for coming on with us tonight for this, this special conversation. We love you. We appreciate you. We value you as husbands, as fathers, as sons, as mm -hmm. uncles, as pillars in the community, as, as men who are trying to um, be... Um, be the guiding light for others. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. All right, appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank now. you. Bye -bye. Bye. All right. Whew. Well, I appreciate both of them coming on with us. So, next up, we have a couple of folks um, to join us. So, um, she was on our. You know, we we had Charlotte uh, Cables on. I think it's just been two weeks now. Mm -hmm. it, it, and in those two weeks since you've she's been on, we've had the Ahmaud Arbery situation. We've had, you know, Breonna Taylor come to light. Like, so these were situations that were in the that happened. Yeah. That came to light after the fact. And we're here today. Um and so we want to bring Charlotte back on what she does. She does anti-racism work and we want to bring her on. And then I also reached out to my friend, Dr. Candace, and we're going to bring her on as well because her word in the clinic today was anti-racism. And as you know, Dr. Candace is a pediatrician and um, the mediatrician and has her um, kidding around with Dr. Candace by podcast. She's a uh, family here at Hey Sister, but we want to have her on because we want to talk about how do we have these conversations with our children and how do we keep them whole. So Charlotte and Dr. Candice, Charlotte, we got to unmute, unmute your microphone, Charlotte. There we go. Hello, hey sisters and Dr. Candice. Hey sisters. <laughs> so ladies, thank you for joining us. You know, we had to start off um, talking to the some brothers because um, I know that they're feeling it in a way that we feel it differently. Like we're feeling it too, but it, it, it's a different <laughs> feeling that um, our black men are feeling. So I don't know, which one do you want to start off? tonight um you know we're just having a conversation well i'll just say that this experience this is for me i've just had to unplug just unplug from facebook because i can't even scroll to see posts without seeing the image image of a brother mm -hmm. dying and that in itself traumatizes us over and over again to a place of paralysis, a place of fear, a place of pain. And we know what we're doing. The images are intentional. It's called race-based trauma. The idea that you even know of someone or can associate with someone who has experienced something so traumatic. So for me, taking care of self has been about stepping away from social media. I definitely step away from the news. I appreciate people who call me to give me updates simply because they know I intentionally step away because Dimitri, I think you said about the men is that it's not just killing them internally. The stress of being seeing these repeated images just alone are causing all of us to have accelerated heart rates and blood pressure and to send our bodies out of whack. And I think it's Dr. Kamara Jones who talks about the stress of race and racism as a uh, um, similar to gunning an engine, that if you put your foot on an accelerator and just keep it there, even at a steady pace, 
that your engine parts are going to wear out faster than if you weren't. And so we, in all, in the midst of everything that's happening, have to do some self-care to even process. I, my day was crazy. I, I, yeah, I just got back in the bed. <laughs> I just got back in the bed because it's a place of comfort work from bed. And I have that luxury to be able to do that. But it was a way of taking care of myself, knowing that so much is going on in the world. And I just encourage all of us to step back from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very powerful. And, you know, we, um, like I said, on Sunday, we are regularly scheduled program for Hey Sister. We will have someone to talk about getting the healing because we we have to talk about how we can um, heal and maintain our wholeness during this time. Um, Dr. Candice. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's very interesting how um, we're all different and how we all process and handle any type of adversity. Um, I would say I'm slightly different than Charlotte in that regard, whereas this does hurt me deeply. Um, I watched the image. I cried. But once I do that, my personality, my temperament um, turns adversity into a challenge, a something I need to conquer, something I need to do something about, something I need to do my part. Mm -hmm. um, that is my self-care, to mobilize, not to be paralyzed, not to be fearful, but that what can I do to prepare for this and help others? And I don't think one way is right or one way is wrong. And maybe Charlotte gets to that point after she, you know, takes care of herself. Right. Um, but I think we're all different. And so when I saw that and I had my moment, I um, it makes me go into my history. It makes me say, OK, I'm going to talk about this on Friday. I'm going to tell people how to talk to their kids. I'm going to try to um, ask my white friends to come on board and be in the struggle. I mean, what can I do with the little bit of something I have? I'm going to talk to my son again. This is harsh. Babe, talking to my husband, should we show this to Miles? Um, I know he's a warrior, but he needs to be aware. He's at an age where it's time to start preparing and prepping him for this. So there's so many things that I just line up and I get busy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I process. And I think we're all very different. Mm -hmm. and yeah. All and so speaking of Miles, so Miles is, um, I know he hit, the, he hit the double digits, right? He's 11. He'll, he'll be 12 11. actually in October. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's so he'll be 12 soon. So yeah. yeah, he's definitely at that. See, I still have him as little miles <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> um, but you know, so Miles soon to be 12. So he's in that that tween stage. Um, I have, you know, my daughter who is um um 13. Um, I have my son who is 17. You know, but I also have my my husband who is in his 50s. I have my father who just turned 70. It's like all of us are impacted. Yes. And so as you think, how do you and I know your baby Marley is um, even is too young to start having the conversation. But how do you start even having conversations? Because the awareness starts like as young as three, two, three years old. Well, you know, we, yeah, we actually, there are actually studies that show infants um, already can identify and show racial preference. And it's just a point of, uh, of um, what's the word, relativity, like what's relative to you. Um, and very soon in those early toddler years, they're identifying a preference of race and skin color and things of that nature. And then we start to putting all of our stuff on them. And by preschool, they're who we are, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. So you how know, are you having those conversations? And I know Charlotte, this is part of the work that you do in training mm -hmm. people to be um, anti-racism and having these anti-racism conversations. 
how do we, how do we, we, we are at a loss for words right now. So that's the other part that's crazy about this. Cause I, I said it the other day to my white people out there, gather your people, Yeah, gather your people because I'm of the mindset at this point, this is not our, we are not going to fix this because we didn't make this system. Not now we can, we can talk about how we want, we want you to recognize our humanity. We want to, we can talk about being a part of the solution, but we didn't create this equation. I don't know. That's where I'm at right now, but you might tell me I'm, I'm. Well, and Demetria, Audrey Lord very clearly tells us that you can't dismantle the master's house with the same thinking that created it. So in the anti-racist realm, we don't believe white people have the clue to mm -hmm. undo it. It will mm -hmm. only be through our leadership that they can follow and, and act in a way. And I want to clarify my stepping back is about getting clarity because we can do some stuff that makes it worse than it is. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when we see white people acting, sometimes in response to our requests, they're not clear about what it has even happened. And so the action makes the situation worse. Then we retaliate because there's a negative impact on us. And then there's this cycle of anxiety and fear that takes white people out of the conversation when people of color are not clear. Mm -hmm. And so even as people of color wanting to act, we've got to know the history. Even I think it was AG was saying, you know, the surprise after President Obama and how hard the fight is now. No, that's what has happened in history. But have we studied it to know that there is always a hard pink pendulum swing after we make any progressive gains that set us back even further? But we're not clear. We like to say we're woke, but we don't even know what sleep feel like. We are so unclear that will not allow us to come together even as people of color. So we have work to do. Mm -hmm. And I always say our generation dropped the ball. At least in the 60s, parents were organizing. We got our educations and we went to the suburbs. It's well, time I'm, I'm not going to say we dropped the ball because I'm going to say, because, you know, it's, I think it's a collective responsibility. Because It I'm is a, a collective responsibility. They, 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 but but they, we they, have not educated. Did they pass us the ball? Huh? Did, did, did they pass us the ball? Well, maybe they didn't pass us the ball. So choice of words. So yeah. now I can say my parents took me, my mm -hmm. parents taught me, my mm -hmm. parents showed me and had accountability. I couldn't just go take care of myself, mm -hmm. even if it was taking care of my siblings, the people in the neighborhood. So my parents did give me that responsibility. Okay. So, but, but I would I, say, I would my say, girlfriend say, I'm good. I got my job, my 2.5 kids and a dog. I'm going home. You go but to the so, I think that that collective, I, I, I have to say it's a collective responsibility. You know, I've been quiet and I've been listening, but, you know, our parents, uh, you know, I remember us growing up watching Eyes on the Prize series. And I, I remember us being very much told, again, these stories about, you know, both of our parents were the product of integration, but they had very different integration experiences. Um, so we, we talked quite a lot about that growing up. So I definitely think they equipped us. But my father and I have always had um, this conversation where I refer to our generation, if you will, as the, as the hip hop generation, so to speak. So I say, you know, there was a disconnect between the civil rights generation and the hip hop generation. I yeah. personally feel like the civil rights generation wants the, the, the Brown versus Board of Education. And we once we were allowed, if you will, to go to the same schools, to eat at the same lunch counters, to do those things, then the focus for a lot of our parents was, I have to make life better for my kids. Right. And that making life better looked like allowing my kids to go to a school that they previously couldn't go to. A lot of that better looked like moving into a neighborhood that I previously couldn't live in. And unfortunately to me, you know, my dad and I always have that conversation about was integration the right thing to do? And we have, you know, he has a different perspective on it than I do. But, you know, we always have that conversation because it's like 
and I, I feel like I see it more and more. So between the civil rights generation to the hip hop generation to now this next generation um, of children and, and, and beyond, it's like we keep wanting to have, as my brother-in-law <laughs> used to say, you know, we think Mr. Charlie's ice water is colder. We That's keep right. trying to reach this Why? American dream, this, oh, every, you know, this, this utopia or this thing. And somehow we feel like that, that mountaintop, if you will, is lily white. It has to mean that I have to live around people who don't look like me. It means that I have to support businesses that are owned by others instead of businesses that are supported are owned by my own. And that's the struggle that I have at when the civil rights generation, you got some legislation passed, but then why did our institutions become less than good enough? Mm. Right. You know, and I, as another piece of that too, sister, and you know, um, and I, this is definitely part of that robust conversation is that I also know that because we've had these conversations in our household. That's why we do Hey Sister, y'all, because we grew up having these type of conversations, you know, um, is that in the quest to make things better for us, they mm -hmm. also stop telling the stories. Mm -hmm. Because and so not knowing those stories. You know, our father, we know that he integrated the athletic program at Nickel State University. We know he lived that first year on campus by himself as the only black student athlete on the campus. But he never really told us the depths of that until recently. You know, so the struggle, the strife, the pain that he experienced, the wanting to give up and leave, the wanting to knock people off their block because they took his, his humbleness for weakness, which we know he's not, you know, but he didn't tell us about that. I don't know if it was a protectionism thing or if it was, what was it, right? And so, you know, he did not have certain conversations with us, but, you know, me, I was, you know, I was always about it, about it as a kid. And so I think about myself as that young person and um, being put out of class for challenging teachers on things that they said about people of color. Mm -hmm. um, I could see Dr. Candace probably was like me. She had her facts and her research. Like, um, this is what it says. That's how you did it, yep. Dr. Candace? Yes, I did. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I, you know, but I, I, I feel you, Charlotte, we definitely need some clarity. We have some comments here. I want to, um, bring up on the screen. Um, one of them is long here. Um, it says, this is very interesting. And I often wonder when I should start teaching my daughters about white supremacy, racism. I want to instill in them black pride from an early age. And I often worry about the cartoons they watch and the messages they're being taught um, taught to them. I worry about them looking up at to cartoons like Frozen and want to be like Elsa, a white woman, and want to have her hair and etc. Dr. Candace, can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. It is so important. So we talk about racism being an adversity or adverse child experience for children, right? Mm -hmm. It is traumatizing. And so how do we overcome that? So we give, we, we equip ourselves with these protective factors for our kids and we try to build resilience in them because it's coming their way. Um, so we need to tell them about racism. We need to tell them what racism looks like. We need to give them examples. And it comes up in our lives all the time. You know, when it's something on TV or in the news or in day to day life or just a little story, kids learn very well by stories and giving them history, just having a wealth of knowledge of things that's happened in history and sitting down every Saturday. You know, Jewish people, Asian people have you know, Hebrew school and all of these different avenues to make sure they have positive racial identity in their culture and their religion. And we don't do that as much. And we should do that with our kids so they know where they come from, know who they are. They know their history before slavery, how much of a wonderful civilization Africa was. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those types of things. So all of that would give them a positive racial identity, which is a huge resilience uh, factor against all of the 
trauma of racism, to give them the ability to heal themselves, to overcome that when it comes their way and be equipped to handle it and call it out and have a plan for this is what I do. My mom taught me about this already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important. I appreciate you saying that, Dr. Candace, because um, I remember singing to my sister's belly, I'm black and I'm proud, say it loud. Mm -hmm. And she would start kicking and my sister would be like, stop it, stop it. If my baby comes out militant, it's going to be all your fault. <laughs> but she had a line of black dolls for every age bracket there could be before she was born, because we knew those messages were important for them to have or for her to have. But it was at age two that she came home from school and said, Mommy, I don't want to wear my hair and braids and beads anymore because they're ugly. And we knew she liked shaking her beads all over the place. And we read, I love my cotton candy hair every night. At two, in preschool, in daycare, she had already received messages about how her blackness wasn't beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that conversation was just the beginning at two years old, a conversation about black beauty and the messages the world will give you, even the people that we leave you with. Mm -hmm. and they have authority over you will still give you negative messages. And even when you hear mommy and sister saying and doing some stuff that we've told you does and it doesn't match, you call us in. So right. at what she's eight, nine now. She, when we boycotted um Papa John's and she didn't go there for that first Friday for pizza night, mommy. I thought we were having pizza. Why are we not going to there? Well, baby, they're not so nice. There are white people in there, aren't there, mommy? <laughs> Be, you know, her mama is calling me on FaceTime saying, let me tell you what your niece just said. Because mm -hmm. she's uncomfortable having a conversation. But she needs to have the conversation because she gets it. She's mm -hmm. Faced with it every single day, whether or not we have the conversation or not. So there is not an age that is too young. And I think, Dr. Candace, you said it's relative. It's relative to what your experiences are, your comfort level, mm -hmm. because she picks up the phone and says, Aunt Charlotte. And we have a conversation that she and her mom don't have. Mm -hmm. So we, even in our storytelling of the history in the past, have to equip our kids with their voice because, baby, what you're experiencing is real. I'm not going to tell. My nephew said, well, I started when someone says something bad about you. If you say something back, you're just as bad as them. Who told you that? <laughs> Where'd you get that message? Because no, baby, you should always use your voice to stand up for yourself. We have to be strategic about it. Mm -hmm. Well, you I, I have a your voice I have now. A, I have a comment over at my watch party, and I'm going to say, Kenyatta, come on over to the Hey Sister page so we can make sure we see it. But I wanted to read it because. She said, we try and have these conversations with our kids, but it's so different for them because most of their friends are white. Then we come off as not being accepting. It's only when something drastic occurs, then their world is shook. And, um, you know, I, I will say this, um, having at the time of us growing up in Thibodeau, we lived, we were one of the first families, black families in our neighborhood, if not the first. The first. Uh, <laughs> okay, we were the first black family in our neighborhood. And I know, Charlotte, when you were on the last time, <laughs> a few weeks ago, you mentioned having your first sort of racial experience at the age of two, with mm -hmm. someone calling you a racial slur. For me, I can remember it as early as the age of six. And it was because the uh, my neighbors, you know, they, the young lady that lived next to me, or the girl who lived next to me, and the girl who lived next to her, they would play with each other every day, but they would never play with me. And it was only until one of them wasn't home that they would come over and play with me. But then as soon as the other one came home, then they would go back to playing with each other. And I, it was as if I, I, I wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. I recognized that as early as six years old, that the thing that made me different was I had brown skin. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think sometimes 
as parents, I'm not a parent, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but I think sometimes parents are, we shy away from these conversations because we want to protect our babies. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is they are, they are bombarded with these images, with these conversations, you know, as Sean mentioned about Elsa, Hey, Elsa frozen, that's a great movie, you know, but so is, you know, the princess and the frog. Uh, Well, I mean, I'm saying, for a kid, like the kids love it. Let it go, let it go. And, you know, there's a lot that they should let go, but they love it. But then, you know, so with Lion King, and which we know the real one, not not this new situation, but the animated one. You know, that was on the continent of Africa, and even though it was animals, it had great, you know, imagery and message and theme. So I think that there are ways to balance it because. Whether you have the conversation, it's kind of like sex. Whether you have the conversation with them or not, it's the fine. messages are out there. They're going to get them. Mm-hmm. So there was a couple things I want to, there's a couple, there's a lot of comments here. So I'm going to kind of flow through yeah. some of them. We had a few, um, uh, Katrina agreeing with you on several things, Charlotte. And she was like, child, we need to uh, be honest with our children from jump, in my opinion. But she was talking about agreeing with you. We had another question here. How do we teach them without traumatizing them? I think that's part of that's part of the great challenge that we have. Let's see what else we have down here. Um, the only way to protect our babies is not to tell. The only way to protect our babies is not to tell them the truth. Our role as parents is to prepare them, arm them, and be real with them. Um, I think that meant that then we want to tell them the truth. Right. right. Yes. 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 I think that's what... Yeah. Um, okay. And then we have another one. Right. They they need to stand up for themselves. Period. When they get in trouble about standing up for themselves, tell your child. Tell them call my parents and I and I will wait. <laughs> and I absolutely, you know, that's a conversation. Um. Yeah. That's what she's saying is to tell them the truth. That's what. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, but even yeah. that one is hard. You know, I listened to D.L. Hewley, who talks about his son, and this was this was something that I saw. So, of course, with Floyd, uh, with George Floyd's situation, there was a, a, a another um, video that came out, and I think it people were saying it was in the UK. I don't know, but this young man ha- was wielding a knife, and the police were, you know, trying to get it out of his hand. It, all white people in this situation. And they ultimately hit him with a car to knock him down and took the knife and then they arrested him, whatever. And, you know, of course the feeling was, oh, if he was black, he would have been dead. He had a knife. He was, he was trying to like break the window of one of the police cars, whatever. But it was apparent to me that this, he was mentally, um, you know, he had a different ability. Let's put it like that, different mental ability. And um, that's one of the things that DL Hewley has mentioned about his son. He's like, you know, what really concerns him is if his son gets stopped by the police and he does not understand what is happening. And he said he has told his son, just tell them, call, call your dad, just call your dad. But again, if you get an asshole and pardon my French, but if you get an asshole who doesn't have the mental capacity to even recognize somebody who has a different ability, um, mental capability, and they don't care, would they even do that? And that that's a whole nother part of the conversation that, you know, this is happening to black men and women who have all their faculties, but so many of uh, it, these type of crimes are on the rise for those who have mental um, challenges. Yes. And for people with autism, this is very, yeah. very real situation and a very scary, scary situation. And so black people with autism are on the spectrum in any way who may be having a mental health break. We know those numbers are higher and we don't always see those on film. And so that's the thing what we're talking about. So much of this is we, we are not, we are not seeing on film and it is, it, it, you know, we have so much, you know, work to do. So how do we do the work? I know we all, we, I wanted us to just go an hour today, um, you know, but let's get a little positivity on about, you know, what <laughs> we do. You know, the situation with George Floyd is just absolutely unhandled. It's hurtful, it's painful. 
There are riots in cities all across this country. There are protests in cities all across this country. There is unrest in cities all across this country. And it's because it didn't just start with George Floyd. Right. We have seen it too many times. Yeah. Too many times. And so how can we, we're not okay. We are not okay. And it's okay to not be okay. But any words to help us start to get okay? I'm gonna go to you first, Charlotte. <laughs> Um, you know, on the airlines that none of us are flying, they tell us to put the mask on yourself before you take care of your neighbor. And that is when it comes to um, health, mental health, but it also comes to education and learning our history as well. But even bigger than that, I think the one thing that we have to do is build relationships with each other. How many of us have authentic, genuine relationships where you will tell someone your deepest pain? We're having a conversation now, but the conversation we would have off camera would be a lot more intense than what it is now because of our relationships. And so how do we begin to walk through life every single day? being genuine and authentic as people of color and not switching it up when we talk to white people. How about we don't even challenge white people enough to call them white people in front of them? We, and my pet peeve is whispering. Why are you whispering? White people are going to be okay. Every system in this country was built to take care of them. And you want to whisper? Yes, because we've been taught to in order to stay safe. But that's some of the stuff that we do. Code switching, that's my favorite. Switching it up, you know, I'm professional on the phone. That's stuff that we do that perpetuates. And so having to learn how we show up that give white people and systems permission to continue doing what they're doing. And then even the expectation that I see you down there, Katrina, talking about not me. <laughs> I think that's why we connect. Um, but this whole idea that, uh, that, you know, this country, white people, there's a social contract. I think my um, friend, white colleague, David Billings, in his book, Deep Denial, which I would recommend for all of us to read, including white people, the social contract that this country has with white people won't allow them to step too far out to speak against racism or they get their hand cut off. Mm -hmm. So we the, knowing our relationship with each other or having a relationship with each other and knowing our relationship to racism is the work that we have to do in order to unite and hold systems accountable for how they impact us. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for coming on tonight in lieu of your normal, uh, uh, or I forgot, no, we, know better. Better. Do well, we know better, do better. Yeah, thank you so much. Dr. Candace, your closing remarks. You know, I'm always going to come from that <laughs> pediatric perspective. That's my live, eat, breathe, sleep thing. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, as far as our families and our kids, absolutely. All the things we've talked about with making our homes, our kids, our families well-educated, self-determined, advocating for ourselves, um, being strong in who we are um, so that we are prepared to go out into the world and present ourselves and advocate for ourselves. So in any way that you um, can prepare your kids for that and talk to them along those racial lines, do so. Um, in my field, I continue along with tons of other um, African-American women, doctors, whenever, I hear, see, feel, even think something is racist or discriminatory to be able to ask the question, um, you know, what do you mean by that? That, eh, no, 
eh, and I you call it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we ask that question and put them in a spot, you know, one of the favorites I always hear is, you know, black, you know, African Americans 50 times more likely, and da, 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 da. And so then it's race is a risk factor. Yeah. And then I raise my hand and I say, well, when you give that stat, like my good friend, Dr. Tamara Lewis, when we talked to my podcast and she heard a terrible story like that in a, in a big conference. And it's like, well, you gave that stat and it paints us in a negative light, but why are you seeing that in your research happening? Why is that happening? She knew the answer. And the oftentimes the presenters don't look for the why. And deep in that why is distrust is a history of Tuskegee and and, and unethical things happening to African-Americans are are real things rooted in racism that keep us from being healthy, Mm -hmm. that keep us from being whole. And so we have to call these things out when we hear them, when we see them. Um, I do think that we can get further um, when we speak their language just like I talk to people about reaching kids and disciplining their kids and, and, and getting their kids to obey and, and have good behavior by getting on their level. Mm-hmm. And so I do think there is a level of cleverness in that. Um, like you said, strategy mm-hmm. and, and our deliverance of that. So when we sit in these tables and we're in a C-suite conversation, if we hear something that doesn't sound right, we should be able to call that out in a way that it is received. And then we still walk out of there like, "Mm -hmm, y'all just don't know, you know, type of thing. Okay. And so I think that's important that we do not sit back and let this stuff fly. And any chance that we get to be in the boardroom, that we are putting our agendas in there, that we are infusing and fighting for our people and fighting for equity and and making sure that our needs are being met as much as possible. Okay. Well, ladies, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm going to, you know, release you all. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. We needed to to hear from you. Um, Your perspectives are valued so much. And um, we thank you for being a part of, of the Hey Sister family. And we want to, to acknowledge you too, as, as mothers, um, I know you don't have biological children, Charlotte, but you're a mother to many. <laughs> so as mother, as aunts, as sister, wife, friend, we want to acknowledge you and, and celebrate you and thank you um, for showing up today and, and being, being in this conversation um, with us. And I just want to affirm you because we need to affirm each other more often as well, too. So um, thank you. With that being said, thank you. Thank the two of you for holding space where people can feel mm-hmm. and be. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, so, you much. so much for having me tonight. Enjoyed the conversation. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. All right. So, sister, I see we have a few more folks saying a great conversation tonight. Great convo. Um Great show, Mr. Robert Payne. You're supposed to come on with us, but I'm going to catch you later. Um, yes, thank you for what you're doing. Um, thanks. Really enjoyed the conversation. So we had those um, tonight. So we're we're not okay. I know we're not going to be okay by Sunday. Um, we are thankful that there was an arrest today. We think that there are more arrests that are due But more so than the arrests, it's we need to get to the fundamental change. And Charlotte is absolutely right. I know what AG said about, you know, when President Obama became elected, how it seems like we've gotten worse. But this has happened throughout history. You know, when Reconstruction happened, when we made gains, boy, honey, they pulled those gains back real quick, fast, in a hurry. We had so many uh, Black legislators and we were moving forward. Same thing with in the civil rights era, when that civil rights um, legislation passed, what we know for a fact is that some who got even the greatest benefit of those things were white women. 
You know, they got some of the greatest benefit from a lot of the, the civil rights work that was done. Um, but we cannot forget their names. We cannot forget their names. And regardless, because I know the crime people, big anti-crime, whatever the crime is, doesn't require a death sentence. So whether it's slow rolling through a stop sign, uh, you, you got a fake bill that you, because we all, some of us have had counterfeit bill pass us. We didn't even know how we got it, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever the, the, the crime may have been, didn't deserve a death sentence. We know that sitting in your house don't deserve a death sentence and someone coming to your a house. We know that playing in the park as a 12 year old Tamir Rice was did not deserve a death sentence. These death sentences have to stop. And the only way we get to that is if we start confronting the very real issue around racism in this country. And so maybe part of the bright spot tonight is that multi-ethnic groups of people, white people, young people, older people, black people are all out protesting all over this country. So maybe that is the bright spot. So I'm going to hold on to that and hope that we, um, we can start getting to the root of this issue so that we can dismantle this system and build a new. That's my closing remarks, sister. <laughs> oh, um, I had a lot to say while different people were talking. And so I didn't get a chance to jump in or I didn't jump in, shall I say. Um, to what AG said about a black, you know, what black people getting together and having sort of an agenda. Um, there are black people who have done that or are, are, are trying to do that. Um, you know, I haven't yet read the manifesto that came, or the piece that came out in the Washington Post, but I will definitely do that um, sometime soon. But again, even if we wrote all of the pieces down where we need to be, where we feel like we've been hurt, harmed, disrespected. Um, it, it doesn't, it won't change people who aren't willing to change, you know, because this is not about them not knowing what our feelings are. Again, um, we have been watching white people gather their children and bring them to public lynchings for decades. That is not new. At least a century. <laughs> At least a century. Or more. Or more. And we 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 know that you know this idea that we're not seen as human beings, but some of our ancestors were raped by their slave masters and had children. Thus, all of our different hues or what have you. You clearly understood the our humanity because. If we were not human, we wouldn't be able to appropriate and bring forth life. So it's just, I just have so many thoughts running through my mind right now. I think, um, you know, I want us to get out and vote and I don't want us to just vote in the presidential election. I want us to vote even for the school board. Um, I want us to support black businesses and support each other um, because we don't have to spend our money with corporations that don't support us in our causes. Um, there are other people that are out there doing things that we can support. Um, I do want us to serve on juries because what's going to happen is this man is being charged with third degree murder. We know that that is not right. Well, they are already trying to paint the picture of George Floyd died because he had underlying health conditions. Well, if he was going to die, then he should have been allowed to die his natural death and not to die with somebody's literal knee in his neck. 
that's what he should have been allowed to do from a human standpoint. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I have so many thoughts and um, I'm tired like everyone else, um, but I'm not holding back anymore. So whether I'm in a meeting in corporate America or I'm on Hey Sister, I'm going to say exactly how I feel. And for anybody who has a problem with that, I'm sorry, but you'll get over it. I'm not sorry for what I say. I'm sorry, but you'll get over it because your hurt feelings has nothing. It's nothing in comparison to the mothers, the fathers, the family, the friends who have to bury their kids and their loved ones. Like you said, for shit that shouldn't even be a death sentence. So, um, yeah, I just, um, I mean, I hope that mountaintop, that um, that place, that promised land that Dr. King spoke of, I guess I hope we get there one day. All right. Well, with that, we're going to sign off tonight. Please join us back here on Sunday as we have a, another guest, um, Ms. Angela Bodie with the um, Health and Wellness Partnership. Another friend of Hey Sister. And, um, you know, we're going to have a conversation about healing and how we get to healing. So like, follow and share. Please share this broadcast with others. Um, we're going to upload this on YouTube. Let's continue this conversation in the comments. and and wherever and whenever you want to talk reach out so we can have this um conversation live because we do have to support one another so with that we're signing off and thank you for watching um tonight's special broadcast of hey sister good night <laughs>